Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about something I'm not hearing anyone else discuss right now, and that is my concerns about how difficult it's going to be to actually refloat the MV Dolly at the Key Bridge site. As we know, the Dolly went off course following a power failure. It exited the federal channel, knocking the pier down, which caused the collapse of the Key Bridge. Now, I'm not a shipping expert, I'm not a salvage expert, but I am a geotechnical engineer, and right now the MV Dolly is stuck in the mud. And there are calculations that you can do to estimate the amount of force that it's going to require to pull the Dolly out of the mud in the channel at the Key Bridge site. Now, as we know, there's still rescue and salvage operations going on to remove the bridge debris from the shipping channel. Those efforts are going to continue through the coming weeks. That bridge debris has to be removed from around the MV Dolly, as well as the debris that's on the bow of the ship right now, pushing it down into the mud in the channel. Now the federal channel is 700 feet wide and 50 feet deep. And you can see from this Corps of Engineers graphic, the MV Dolly drifted off course and is out of the federal channel for the most part. If you look at the footprint of the dolly, most of it's out of the federal channel at this point with the bow of the ship the farthest out of the channel. Now here's a sonar image released by the U.S. Navy and it shows the MV dolly. The lighter yellow color is below the waterline and the red's above the waterline. So you can see the current draft of the ship maybe on the order of 30, 35 feet right now. And you can see that a significant portion of the ship's hull is in contact with the muddy sediments of the Patapsco River. Now I presume the mud consists of silty clay based on the soils that are in that area as opposed to say a predominantly sandy sediment. I'm gonna go through the methodology for calculating the force that's gonna be required to pull this ship back into the federal channel. So this isn't unlike the situation that happened in March of 2021 at the Suez Canal in Egypt, where the Ever Given became stuck in the channel, both at the bow and stern sides of the cargo ship. Overall, the Ever Given blocked the Suez Canal for a full one week period. And the actual refloating operation took about two to three days in total. So for a quick overview on how they refloated the Ever Given in Egypt, they dredged the sediment around the hull of the ship. And in this case, it was predominantly sandy soil. They used excavators to remove material from around the hull of the ship. And they tried a couple different things with uh, tow boats to try and get the ship moved back into the main channel. Those initial efforts were not successful, but here's an animation showing you what they ended up doing. They've got four smaller tugs on the side of the ship, two larger ones pulling at the stern, and a, another two large tugboats that will be pulling at the bow of the ship. To basically pivot the ever given about its axis so it's aligned in the main portion of the channel. And as I mentioned, this was the effort that was ultimately successful when they did it at a time coinciding with high tide. All right, so let's go back to this sonar image. We know that the overall length of the dolly is about 978 feet. So looking at this sonar image, I would estimate an approximate 200 foot length of the hole that's in contact with the sediment at the bottom of the channel. And based on descriptions from di diving operations, these divers typically can't see the hand in front of their face. So it sounds like there's a lot of turbidity, very soft sediment at the base of the channel. And looking at those earlier images, we know the dolly's width or beam is about 158 feet. So conservatively, if I estimate that perhaps half of the ship's width is in contact with the mud, and that could be well on the low side, but let's just take a contact area of the ship's hull with the mud over an area of, say, 200 feet by 75 feet. And you can actually perform a calculation to determine the amount of force that's required to move an object relative to surrounding clay soils. This is done all the time to determine pile capacity for 
land-based structures, ocean-based structures. In fact, the American Petroleum Institute has this method for determining the capacity on a pile in clay. It's called the alpha method. And I think this will be a useful method for coming up with the estimate of how much force is going to be required to pull the dolly back into the channel. So adhesion of clay is essentially how tightly a clay sticks to another object, whether it's a steel pile or the steel hull of a ship. And that adhesion is a function of the undrained cohesive strength. So if we're talking about clay soils, which I believe we are for the Patapsco River, adhesion is going to be the force that has to be overcome in order to get this ship moved back into the channel. So for very weak soils like I think we have here, the adhesion value is equal to the undrained cohesion. So now we've estimated area 200 feet by 75 feet. Now I'm going to estimate an undrained cohesion and my adhesion factor is one. So if I take the area times the cohesion, that will give me a force. So let's assume the co a cohesion value at a very low end of say 100 pounds per square foot. That's, that's quite low value for clay, but could be consistent with the very soft nature of the clays that are likely to be at the bottom of that channel. So if we take 200 feet times 75 feet, that's a contact area of 15,000 square feet. If I multiply that by my cohesion of 100 and divide that by 2,000 to get tons force, I'm looking at roughly 750 tons of force required to overcome the adhesion at the base of the hole. So I made some simplifying assumptions. One of them is that the ship isn't being pulled into a giant pile of soil at the stern, which I think is the direction they're going to be moving the ship into. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to neglect that for simplicity at this point. I'm also going to neglect suction. In clay soils, if you remove an object fast enough, you produce a suction, which is an additional force above the adhesion that has to be overcome in order to move the object. So I'm sure many of you have had this experience where you've been ankle deep or more in soft, wet clay, and you rapidly try and pull your foot out of the mud, and you can't. It's just like an extra force pulling you down. Well, that's the suction. You find if you maintain a constant, steady pressure, slowly that suction will break down and you're able to pull your foot out of the mud. So in this instance, I'm, I'm neglecting suction as well. Now this can be a significant issue if you're trying to remove objects from the seabed. There were multiple episodes of submarine incidents in the 1960s where someone was concerned about what would happen if their sub touched bottom or if a sub had touched bottom and there was some disaster, how much force would it take to extract the submarine from the seabed. And so the government actually funded this study looking at this very question in the late 1960s. From what I understand, there are sub submarines that are designed such that they can touch the seabed and others that can't and, and never will unless there's some kind of accident. And this principle of suction of an object on the seabed has been put to good use in the last few decades. Uh, suction piles or suction cans, as they're sometimes called, are routinely used in offshore oil production roles. And in this case, you lower the foundation. It consists of multiple, basically, giant pipe piles. They're open on the bottom, and they'll sink into the soft seabed. And oftentimes, there's some extra pumping at the top of the pile. The, the top is, is sealed. And then the pile penetrates in, into the seabed, and then there's uh, legs or cables that are attached to the top of the pile and tethered to the object that they're trying to moor in the, in the ocean. And as these cables or legs have waves or other upward pulling loads, a suction force quickly develops and provides additional resistance for the foundation on these structures. So let's go back to the dolly. I think their efforts are going to be further complicated by the geometry of everything that's around it. So as we know, the remnants of the pier between spans 16 and 17 are still there up against one side of the dolly. The salvage efforts have included 
removing some of the shipping containers. From what I understand, there's roughly 4,700 shipping containers on the dolly right now, and they're planning on removing perhaps 170. That doesn't sound like a lot given the overall total, but uh, we'll, we'll see how much rebound occurs. Right now, the dolly's listing, and the, the bow of the ship is pushed downwards under the weight of the overlying debris on its bow. Let's look at this image here of the geometry that we have here. So the, the stern of the ship is facing upstream. The bow is pointing more or less downstream. You had these small dolphins that are located in front of the piers at the main span. I don't think this dolphin was even contacted by the dolly. It's so far upstream. But you can see here, I, I think what's going to happen, let's imagine that this bridge debris is removed from the bow of the ship. The dolly is going to have to be pulled back into the channel. It's going to have to be pushed from the front, pulled in the back. And it's going to be challenging to be able to rotate the ship very much by having tugs on the side. Because once the dolly rotates just a little bit, it's going to be impacting this upstream dolphin. So I think it's going to be quite the tricky operation here. So going back to the computation of 750 tons force required to overcome the adhesion. From what I understand, there's two main classes of tugboats, one that's around 2,500 horsepower and another that's 5,000 horsepower. And I imagine this corresponds to what we saw with the refloating of the Ever Given in Egypt. You had set a set of uh, large tugs and a set of smaller tugs. So these 5,000 horsepower tugs can produce a force of around 70 tons on, at its max, and the smaller tugs between 25 and 30 tons. So in rough numbers, you would need 11 uh, of the larger tugs at, at a minimum. And uh, to configure the lines, the placement of the tugs in the limited access that exists at this channel is going to be really, really tough. And again, I think this 750 tons force required to pull the ship back into the channel is quite possibly on the low side. If the undrained cohesion of the clay is higher, even though the adhesion factor would be lower, you'd still have a greater force required to pull the ship in, back into the channel. If the contact area was greater than what I've estimated, for this simple calculation, then again, the force is going to go up considerably. I've also neglected the forces required to overcome a pile of material at either end of the ship as the ship moves into that material. So I imagine there's going to be some dredging going on to remove that material so that that's not an extra force required to be overcome. Uh, it, it limits the amount of suction that can develop as the ship's being moved back into the main channel. I also think it may be necessary to demolish what's left of that pier between spans 16 and 17 to give the dolly more room to rotate back into the channel. So I'd be curious what you all think about this. Again, it's not anything that I'm hearing in the media right now about, hey, can this salvage operation, once it's complete, lead to a successful refloating operation? You know, in a worst case scenario, the dolly would have to be salvaged in place and I don't think that's going to happen, but I also think the effort to get it refloated is going to be uh, much more extensive and much more problematic than anyone's discussing at this time. I want to send out a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate y'all's support. I also want to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. And of course, those of you who have liked, subscribed, and left comments to these videos. I've got more coming, so thanks for watching, everyone.